You know, I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I am someone who really enjoys my sleep. Uh, the truth is you can't stay this beautiful without getting at least eight hours of beauty sleep a night. If I get six hours or less, this is what I look like. <laughs> yes, that is me. But sometimes I can't get a good night's sleep if if my head falls off the pillow and I sound like this. <laughs> now, just for the record, listen to me. Terry never snores. Never. Absolutely never. She never has. She never will. When she sleeps, she is either completely silent or makes just beautiful, gentle, soothing noises. And that's why I feel bad for her to sleep next to a cow like me. Sometimes I think she needs one of these in our bed just to uh, help things out. <laughs> that is brutal that is but hey you got to do what you got to do when you value sleep right and as someone who values sleep i can completely understand why some might fall asleep during a sermon you know, I do find that there is a direct correlation between zoning out and then falling asleep and the topic of the sermon. Yeah, there is. There's a tie-in. Because if it's a sermon on wives, husbands might find themselves zoning, and then enough zoning is going to call you to kind of doze off, right? If it's a sermon on adults, the kids might zone out. If it's a sermon on kids, well, then the adults might zone out. If it was a sermon on patience, you'd be like, I, I am patient. I already know all this stuff and I don't need to listen. Can we get moving, please? Oh, yeah, you're patient. Yes, you are. So different people zone for different topics that they think might not necessarily apply to them. That's why today I'm not going to tell you what the topic of the sermon is, because if I did... Then there'd be a bunch of you that would be like, oh, I'm not listen to this sermon, and I'm just going to go ahead and zone right out. I feel like there'd be more people sleeping during my sermon than there would be at a nursing home after a Thanksgiving meal and they crank the heat. You know what I'm saying? But I promise you that if you listen long enough, you're going to understand why this applies to all of us and none of us should be zoning. But still not going to tell you what the topic is. So we find ourselves today in 2 Kings chapter 5, and our story starts off with a man by the name of Naaman. Naaman, N-A-A-M-A-N. Now, Naaman, for all intents and purposes, he was a pretty impressive guy. Naaman was the commander of the army of the kingdom of Aram, which is just to the north of Israel. Now, he wasn't any old commander. He was the best of the best. He was good at his job. He had won a ton of battles. And because he was such uh, an impressive guy, the king of Aram was actually a big fan of his. Listen to how Naaman is described uh, in this scripture. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but... Oh yes, there's always a but, isn't there? But he had a big nose. But he snored a lot at night. But he was a little cross-eyed. I mean, what's a but going to be this time? But he had leprosy. Uh, <laughs> that's a pretty big but. <laughs> anyway, so this pretty remarkable guy is great at his job. Um, in a position of authority, favored by the king, but he's a leper. He has leprosy, and that is a big problem. 
You see, a cure for leprosy wasn't even found, believe it or not, until the 1940s. And it only works now if it's caught early. Otherwise, leprosy is something that's eventually going to kill you. So Naaman, he had no chance of survival. And eventually he knew he was going to die a very painful death. But Naaman lucks out because one of his slaves is familiar with Israel and he tells him, hey, there's a prophet in Israel that actually might be able to heal your leprosy. He can do some pretty amazing things when God lets him. So when Naaman hears of this, he decides, hey, that's pretty close. It's just south of us. This is definitely worth a visit. And Naaman eventually winds up at Elisha's door. Now, when Naaman pulls up outside of Elisha's house, he's, he came with all of his chariots and, and his complete entourage. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It would have been something that would be very impressive to see. So he pulls up to Elisha, and then he waits outside for Elisha to come out and meet him so that he can ask him to be healed from this leprosy. But Elisha doesn't come out. Instead, Elisha sends out his servants with instructions that what Naaman needs to do in order for God to heal him. But Elisha doesn't even come out and tell him himself. And Naaman does not take to this too kindly. I mean, he's Naaman. He's Naaman. This guy won't even come out and talk to him, but he's Naaman. Yeah, in verse 11, Naaman says this, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure my leprosy. He basically throws his big hissy fit, doesn't he? That's what he does. He can't do that to me. Doesn't he know who I am? What does Naaman do? Forget it. I'm leaving. Nobody treats Naaman like this. Nobody. What kind of response is this from Naaman? Well, it's a pretty prideful response is what it is. Naaman was reacting out of pride. And, oh, now I just told you the topic of the sermon. And now we're in trouble. And now maybe you're tempted to zone because you're thinking, he must be talking to somebody else because I never sounded like that. Clearly, I don't struggle with pride. You don't struggle with pride. Are you sure about that? Because here's the thing about pride. Pride is one of those sins that kind of hides itself as something else. So if you want to see whether or not you have pride... It's not going to be super obvious. You have to look at the subtle clues instead. So let me get that hamster wheel of a brain of yours spinning around right now um, and ask you about some of these subtle clues. Ask yourself these questions, okay? Because these are some symptoms of pride that might not seem overly obvious in the beginning. Let me ask you, are you easily offended? Do you seem to get offended a lot? Do you find it difficult or impossible to apologize when you've done something wrong? Or is your apology something like, I'm sorry that you made me do that? Do you find, do you easily find what is wrong in someone else's life? Do you always have to win the argument? Do you put being right above being kind? Do you hold on to hurts for an extended period of time? Do you ever speak about the sins of others with complete annoyance? Do you work hard at how people see you publicly? Man, I can't even tell you how many times I've said or done something to my kids and then looked around to make sure that nobody was watching. Do you immediately get defensive if someone questions something that you did? Do you refuse to ask for help when needed? Do you talk about yourself a lot? Do you blow people off when they text you? If it's yes, then that's a sign that you consider your, your time more precious than their time is. Do you always thank someone who does something for you, even if it was part of their job? Do you seldom find yourself complimenting or encouraging others? You see, Pride isn't just walking around with your nose turned up at the world and your head held high. That's what we like to think of it as, but it's more subtle than that. Now, seriously, I just gave you a, an entire list of questions. Tell me, tell me that some of those don't apply to you. Go ahead. 
Go ahead, tell me that you are the humblest person you know. Yeah, there, there's irony in that, folks, in case you didn't pick up on it. What exactly is pride? Well, pride is the opposite of humility. I once heard about a lady who came to a pastor with the theological questions about heaven. She said, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to get my robe over my wings without bending them. And the pastor replied, if I were you, I wouldn't be worried about that. I'd be worried about how you're going to get your halo on over your horns. <laughs> Philippians 2, 3 says this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Well, that is not an easy command, I tell you that for sure. And understand, this scripture isn't telling us to have awful, awful self-esteem. <laughs> this scripture is not telling us to have awful self-esteem. That's not what it's saying. What it is telling us is that we don't have to push the other end of the seesaw down in order to lift our end up. You see, we live in life on a seesaw with us on one end of the saw and the other end of the saw is the, the rest of the people in our lives. And many Many, many people have the goal of getting their end of the seesaw up into the air, rising above everybody else. That's where we want to be. And the easiest way to do that in their minds is to push down on the other side of the seesaw, on, on the, the people's side of the seesaw. Because if we can get them to push down, then our side of the seesaw is going to go up into the air. But if we hold them down, our side stays up, even though we're not really sitting on it anymore. So what do we do in order to push their side down? Well, we critique, we judge, we stick up our noses. We make sure that everybody knows just how awful they are when in comparison to us, nobody's as good as I am. But in reality, God asks us to hold our side down so that we can lift the other side up, the exact opposite of what we're doing. God asks us to help others rise above us, to praise them, to lift them up, to make them feel good, to serve them, to, in humility, consider and treat others better than ourselves. And what we don't understand is if we would actually take some time into helping them to rise up into the air, to get their side of the seesaw lifted, well, then they would respond in kind with this incredible gift themselves. And then a seesaw would actually work the way that it was meant to work, sometimes up, sometimes down. We would rise in the air, not because we forced their side down, but because they lifted our side up. Do you understand that? Pride never lifts the other seesaw, side of the seesaw up. It just pushes it down. Luckily, Naaman has some really good friends who make him swallow his pride because otherwise he would have missed out on a pretty awesome blessing. Now, Naaman is getting ready to march on back home and not get healed. And then his, sermon, his servants say this in verse 13. My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? They basically say, hey, we know that you were expecting some big, grandiose miracle because, after all, you're Naaman. But that's not what God planned. So since we traveled all this way, what's the harm in trying it? Hmm? Well, thankfully, for just one second, Naaman is able to forget just how awesome he is and what he deserves, and he swallows his pride, and he goes to the river and washes like Elisha said, and he is immediately healed from his leprosy. But his pride almost stopped this amazing miracle from taking place. Let me ask you another set of questions. How many times have you not called somebody because they should be the ones to call? right? I'm not calling, they should call. How many times have you not asked for help because you need a little bit of humility first? How many times have you made a fuss because someone was getting something that you weren't? How many times have you done something because 
you refused to remind somebody else that they were the ones who were supposed to do it. How many times have you insulted a group of people because your group was so much better than their group? How many times have you refused to listen to and consider somebody else's opinion because you already know better than they do? How many times have you made judgments about other races, nationalities, countries, political parties, schools, genders, last names? Folks, pride blinds us. It prevents us from listening. It stops us from talking and it hurts us us more than it hurts anybody else. Naaman would have stayed a leper if he allowed his pride to get so far in the way that he couldn't push through it. But when Naaman humbles himself, when he deflates his head, when he puts others above himself, he's able to receive the blessings that God had in store for him. Verse 14, so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. A life-changing uh, miracle was almost missed because he was too stubborn to see it, because his pride was hurt. And Naaman returns to Elisha, completely humbled and willing to pay Elisha anything that he asks. But Elisha refuses payment and happily sends Naaman on his way. And today... I'm wondering what blessings we're missing out on because our big, old, overinflated heads are getting in the way. I battle pride. You battle pride. We battle pride. Nobody gets his own out on this message. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. So let us stop hiding our pride behind other names and see it for what it really is. And let us do it fast before we miss out on some great big blessing that God has planned for us. And believe it or not, this is not even the end of the story. The story takes a surprising twist that we will most likely hear about next week. That is, if you're not too proud to listen. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Take care. God bless. Hope to see you soon.